All right, uh, welcome everybody. I'm in Kiru Gellis. I'm the chair of Women in Architecture, and I'm really delighted that you're joining us for this first in-series webinar, Advocacy Conversations. Firstly, I'd like to thank our Women in Architecture committee sponsors for their ongoing support. Michael Shu, Office of Architecture, Page, Fluger Architects, McKinney York Architects, Pilgrim Builders, Lucy Miller, with Miller Imaging and Digital Solutions, Artisan Hardwood Floors, Mita Morrison with MMD Architects, Indoor Weather Professionals, McCoy Rockford and Rogers O'Brien, and not forgetting Gus Bernal, our videographer as well. Our mission at WIA is to promote, validate and illuminate the role of women within the architectural field through fostering community, fellowship, education, and outreach. Together with architects, urban planners, activists, and community leaders, we are taking a collaborative approach to information sharing with today's talk, entitled Making Austin More Equitable. Advocacy can be described as the promotion of justice through changes in policies, systems, structures, practices, and attitudes. And as members of the AEC, Professions, we are all stakeholders who play a part in the process of our city making. Our speakers this evening have a very broad range of knowledge and understanding. And through today's discussion, our aim is to raise awareness of equity issues within our built environment, touching on housing insecurity, access to public parks and transportation, access to health and care facilities, as well as maintaining equitable access to a healthy environment. And throughout the evening, I encourage everyone to put any clarifying questions into the Q&A window at any time. All of our attendees should have access to that Q&A window and we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as we can. This evening, I'll be turning things over to our moderator, Mindy Cooper. Uh, Mindy Cooper is a principal at DWG, an Austin-based practice focused on urban architectural landscapes. As a member of the DWG leadership team, Mindy has an active role in shaping many vibrant, resilient urban spaces through her team's work. Mindy has served as chair of the AIA Austin Urban Design Committee and also as a planning committee member of the AIA Austin Leadership Collective Program. Before I hand things over to Mindy, I am thrilled to invite our keynote speaker for the evening, Natasha Harper Madison, City of Austin District One Council Member and recently elected Mayor Pro Tem to address our topic of discussion. Mayor Pro Tem Natasha Harper Madison is the proud representative of District One, which includes the East Side neighborhood where she was born and raised. A wife, mother, cancer survivor and community advocate, Natasha is a champion for expanding equity through empowering civic engagement. Natasha became the first black woman appointed as Austin Mayor Pro Tem in her first term, thanks to her collaborative efforts to advance affordability, public transit and the reimagining of public safety in Austin. So I'll hand it over to uh, Natasha Harper-Madison now. Mindy, on behalf of the panel and our audience, uh, please join me in welcoming Natasha. Thank you for being with us for this evening's conversation. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Oh, oh, I see a thumbs up. Thank you, Ms. Donna. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, like it's already been stated, I am the, the mayor pro tem uh, for the city of Austin and the proud city council representative of district one that's east and northeast Austin. But some folks don't know this. Our district stretches from 7th Street in the southern part of our city all the way up north to Jaeger Lane and then all the way out east to Colony Park. It also includes the northeast section of downtown. Um, the University of Texas, which some folks don't know, including both the state capitol and the DKR Memorial Stadium. Uh, stadium. It was created as the African American Opportunity District and includes the section of East Austin that our 
28 master plan effectively created as Black Austin uh, for decades, 11th and 12th streets, which I like to think of, you know, to some degree as the epicenter. Um, they were the central arteries of a relatively small but very much thriving African American community. The Chitlin Circuit ran through the Victory Grill. Legends like Satchel Page played at Downs Field. Um, homegrown civil rights leaders like Willie Mae Kirk and Balma Overton organized in homes and in the streets. Uh, decades of disinvestment and lack of representation have helped lead to dis, uh, displacement, which we all know is a major problem I'm deeply interested in getting a hold of. That's because this is my community. Um, I anecdotally had the opportunity to be a part of a recovery effort after uh, the winter storm. And I was standing in the parking lot, handing out things to members of my community and my mother and sister literally rolled through. So this is very much my community. My family is here. This is where I was born and raised and lived most of my life. Um, before I ran for council, I was a small business owner who was spurred by a cancer diagnosis to become a community advocate. It was one of those things where if you get the opportunity at the age of 36 to question your mortality, um, it offers something different in the way of perspective. And it offered me uh, an opportunity to recognize that I wanted to make certain that I left a, a legacy my children could be proud of and that I did work that fulfilled me. Um, and that's how I, I you know, sort of dove headfirst into community advocacy um, I was involved in several efforts to help people learn to better advocate for themselves. It was a, a situation where, you know, we recognized the resources were available and there were people who needed the resources, but there was a, a substantial disconnect in them reaching one another. Um, and so once I got a hold of just how big the challenges are that we face and, you know, how many people were going to fall through the cracks, I decided that I, would, I was gonna need a bigger stage. So when I ran in 2018, my three main priorities for the district, um, which fortunately for me haven't changed much, um, were expanding affordability, expanding equity and expanding economic mobility. Since I took the oath of office, we've made some really massive strides towards all those goals. Uh, but we've also made some serious stumbles. Um, it hasn't helped that we've been so preoccupied with the pandemic for the last year. But at the same time, the pandemic has proven the urgent need for action. The pandemic has exposed those festering inequities um, we as a city have overlooked for far too long. Black and brown people uh, put at higher risk because so many of the jobs that they have access to are those essential jobs, those essential workers. Um, that we, we really need and unfortunately frequently put in harm's way. The widespread lack of health insurance, disparate access to clinics, testings, um, now vaccines, artists and musicians and other people who lived paycheck to paycheck who haven't had steady income for almost a full year now. Once this pandemic is over, our obligation is to build a more resilient city so we can be more equitable and more competent and handle these next big crisis. Um, I have a lot to say about affordability, uh, just anecdotally again, and generally um, recognize that one way that we do this is to get a handle on our growing affordability crisis. Austin, uh, as many of you may know, is one of the most economically segregated cities in the country. Um, that you have to be intentional uh, in putting initiatives in play to combat that. We've known about it for years. Uh, we've taken some big steps in the right direction. It just hasn't been enough. Um, it's a basic problem. Tons of people want to live in Austin. We don't have enough housing for them is the problem. So that includes the people who are already here. We're close in being the top 10 largest cities in the country. We're the capital city in the large, very large state of Texas. Um, but we cannot continue to pretend otherwise. Uh, while it was appropriate for a while that we remain this sleepy college town, those days are behind us. Here we are in 2021 and we're still using land use rules from 1985. Uh, I, I think we all recognize, especially the folks in this field, you recognize how problematic that can be. Not everyone can afford to live in a single family home on nearly 6,000 square feet of land. 
And that's our reality. Um, even if they could, not everyone wants to, frankly. Um, we need more housing supply. We need more housing types. And we need both of those things in all parts of town. Um, struggling homeowners should have the option to build an ADU or two if they see fit that they can rent out. And they should be able to do so without needing an army of lawyers and a boatload of money to navigate rezoning and permitting processes. We should allow smaller lots, smaller units, co-ops and other diverse options for people of all incomes and all ages. And we can entice developers um, to subsidize income restricted units for families by offering them more entitlements that help create a walkable, complete community or multiple walkable, complete communities. So we may have lost some audio. Let's let's give it a moment um, to see if we can get Natasha back. She and often hits the wrong button, so give her a minute. She'll, okay. she'll recognize what she did. I've been in meetings with her, so I'm sure she'll log back in. No worries. Thanks, Pamela. Well, perhaps while we we hang on from Natasha, uh, for Natasha, sorry, Mindy, if you would like to take our audience through the the overview for a discussion. Um, and then we'll, we'll see if we can come back to Natasha in a moment. Certainly. Well, I am going to anticipate that I will be cut off, so I'll try not to dive too deep into any one thing, but um, welcome everyone. I'm so, so glad and honored to be here as moderator for this panel. Um, if I get nervous or shaky tonight, it's just because I'm amongst the company of some incredibly intimidating women who I'm so impressed by. <laughs> so if anything happens that's out of the ordinary, it's just because I am just shivering in excitement for all this great conversation that's about to happen. Um, before I get into introducing our panelists or before Natasha rejoins us, um, just a quick overview of the plan. Um, we are going to start with a little bit of a history lesson. So a walk down memory lane. Um, to see how it is that we arrived at this, this uh, junction that we're at today, which is struggling to meet both affordable housing needs and also preserve the cultural history of a community. Um, that is going to be where we spend most of our time tonight. I would encourage you, I'll repeat what Inkira said earlier this evening. If there are questions that come up, please feel free to use the Q&A box as we were talking through. Um, and you're also welcome, we would actually encourage you to continue to use that chat function. Um, I think one of the most rich things that could come out of this conversation tonight is to have all of you connect with each other. I know it's more difficult to do that virtually, but um, this is a great opportunity to find colleagues out there who are interested in doing similar work as you are and making those connections. So please don't let a virtual format stop you from doing so. Um, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end to address some of that Q&A and then give you some action items. Um, we wanna walk away from this conversation, not leaving you feeling like we haven't given you something that you can act on as you go back into your offices um, and into your work. Um, we wanna give you a little bit of a game plan that if you can act on if there's something here tonight that sparks your interest. So that's our plan. Um, and we'll start, we'll start heading into, and I hope since I can only see a few small boxes on my screen. Someone will alert me if Natasha does rejoin. So we'll start here. Um, our panelists tonight, I'm very honored to introduce these four women to you. Pamela Benson Owens is the executive director of Six Square, Austin's Black Cultural Arts District. Pamela has been an entrepreneur for 25 years and most enjoys collaborating and working with organizations to assist in matters regarding all things geared towards organizational effectiveness. Next up is Donna Carter. Donna is a fellow with AIA. She received her BA from Yale University, studied as a Ford Foundation Scholar at the American University in Cairo, Egypt, and received her Master of Architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. As president of Carter Design Associates, Donna has led a practice focused on combining revitalization, historic preservation, urban planning and design with new construction within the context of complete and sustainable communities. Trinity White lives and works in East Austin. Her architecture practice focuses on infill projects with an emphasis on affordability and sustainable design. She proudly represented District 1 on the City of Austin Planning Commission for three years during the city's rewrite of the Land Development Code. And last but not least, oh, 
I heard someone interject. Does that mean Natasha's back? That's right, Mindy. You you anticipated it. Um, we have Natasha back with us again. Sorry to inter interrupt you. No and worries. Sonia, you're going to have to wait for your intro. <laughs> we'll come back to you. So Natasha, you're back with us. Thank you. Thank you for rejoining. Um, we, we are happy to give you the floor again. We'll hand it over to you. I seriously appreciate that. And, and as I'm looking at this panel, I got to tell you, I'm going to I'm, I'm a layman in comparison. Um, and so the, the only other things that I would leave you all with if, if given the opportunity would be, you know, to speak to some of the opportunities that I see um, ahead of us. Uh, I, I think if and when we get more people like the folks on this panel in positions where they can help us create our city in a way that, we, I mean, I think we all recognize what it is that we need to do, being able to subsidize income restricted units for families by offering them um, you know, opportunities, uh, being able to basically require that the city and its partners also invest in affordable housing. Our, our staff, they're overseeing the implementation of the $250 million for affordable housing bond right now. Voters just approved an extra $350 million as a part of Project Connect. It's our massive, the, the first uh, that the country's seen, um, it's our massive investment in transit and recognizing the direct relationship between transit and housing. So that all that money will go towards anti-displacement measures along with our you know, top transit corridor. So they're gonna make sure that people who depend on transit can afford to live near it. There were a couple other things I was gonna yammer on about, but honestly, I, I look forward to, to hearing the members of the panel speak from an expert perspective about what it is that you know folks like me and my colleagues can do to, to make it easier for us to accomplish what I believe are similar goals. So thank you, I appreciate it. I warned you all about my tech skills. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for your patience, everybody. We're just glad to have you back, Natasha. It's really Thanks, an honor Patrick. to have you join us. All right. Well, as I said, last but not least, and I think that's a great cue up actually to our final panelists. So Sonia Trous is the executive director and founder of Yimby Law, a pro-housing nonprofit that enforces state housing law in California. Sonia's previous work led to the formation of Yimby Action, which advocates for geographic equity in zoning and development, integration, environmentally friendly high density development, and high quality public transit with chapters in California and Colorado. So with that, um, super excited to get started. One, we did want to, before we launch into a really meaty conversation, um, we wanted to share with the entire group a few factoids um, so that we are all starting from the same platform. And I will um, invite all of you. I'm, I'm, I'm a landscape architect. I'm not a historian. We do have a historian on the panel, so I'm, I'm hoping that Donna will set me straight in any information I share that needs to be tweaked. But I did want to give everyone a baseline um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the history of Austin, the segregated history of Austin, um, or those of you who are joining us from afar. And I would say um, the, the, the history of Austin is not one that's necessarily unique to our city. This is something that happened categorically throughout our country in the early 1900s. So let's start by looking at a few maps. Um, so the two maps on the left of this screen um, are representative of some planning work that was done in 1927. And this was really a result of a 1917 decision by the Supreme Court that said that segregated zoning was not constitutional. And what happened out of that, um, we still had segregated public facilities, segregated, segregated schools, segregated parks. Um, and so the city of Austin decided to, um, not sure if this is a loophole or how you might describe this, but in order to address the um, restrictions on being able to zone with segregation in mind, they decided to approach this from an incentives point of view. And so the map on the left, all of the areas that are coded in yellow represent um, areas of town that had been developed. So at that point in time in 1927, you saw Hyde Park, you saw Fairview Park just south of Austin. So these new suburbs, suburbs to downtown that were being built were being built with restrictive covenants that uh, essentially made these neighborhoods, white only neighborhoods. The map in the center is a similar map, but this map shows where minority residents were located, where there were no zoning restrictions. 
So the result of these two overlays was that um, the city essentially provided for incentives for people of color to move to the area that's largely shown in pink on east, uh, the east side of I-35, which was then East Avenue. Um, and if, if you were a person of color and you moved to one of, to one of the pink districts on the east side of I-35, you then were able to partake in all of the public facilities that were available to you. You could go to school, you could go to a public park, you had access to all of the facilities that would not be available to you on the west side of I-35. And so through those incentives, a population was, in, was very strongly encouraged to move to the east side of Austin. Um, and then you can see on the map to the far right, uh, this is a plan from 1934, which shows um, essentially this is done by an insurance company to determine which areas of town are the good parts of town and which parts of town are the bad parts of town. These maps are commonly referred to as red line maps. So the areas that are shown outlined in red are described as being declining. And through that designation, um, if you were a homeowner in one of these areas, it becomes very difficult, well, a prospective homeowner, I should say, it becomes very difficult to get a loan or very costly to get a loan. Um, and there are many other uses that these maps were, were used for, but essentially um, this made it very difficult to advance economically um, in the city. So um, one thing I do want to say in this is that as this, as as an entire group of people, as an entire community is forced to move to one side of I-35, what came out of that was actually really rich community. And we'll get into some of, some of that in future slides. Um, the next slide that can click forward shows at the same time, um, or actually a little later, starting in 1970, the development of um, some of the economics around um, our downtown in East Austin. And you can see the scale, uh, inflation is, is not necessarily accounted for in this, in this graphic. So it, it's a bit deceiving and the $15,000 in 1970 is probably not quite the same as $100,000 in today's terms, but you can see the, the vast shift in economic capacity from West Austin in 1970, that becomes darker and darker through the 80s and 90s. And then we move into 2000s as our city is growing and growing and growing. And that uh, wealth begins to transfer from the west side of Mopac into downtown and slowly starts to overtake um, all of East Austin. Um, next slide, please. And then the other piece of this puzzle is the um, trying to look at where, how populations are moving. And we'll string a story together and make some assumptions based on this data um, and based on anecdotal evidence of what's happening throughout this. But you can see this map is census data starting from 1940. So this is 12 years after the 1928 plan goes into effect. And you can see that the intention of the 1928 plan has been realized um, where the African-American population is largely centered east of I-35. Um, you see throughout the next three to four decades, that center becomes less dense. And what's happening during that time frame is that um, there are, um, as I mentioned a few slides back, the, the community that did form in those neighborhoods was rich and layered. Um, there were families of all sizes and types. There, there were poor families, there were rich families, there were, there were all, uh, a really rich layered community had developed. And if you were in a position and had mobility, many families chose to leave East Austin in the 50s and 60s after seeing things like the Holly Power Plant, um, heavy industrial uses, um, you know, the population that Natasha Harper Madison had mentioned that was not well represented in city government was having having to take the burden of a lot of city functions that were not desirable, frankly. So you saw those who had mobility start to move outside of that community, and that's happening into the 70s, 80s, 90s, that population continues to be dispersed. And I will also make note the um, purple color in 1980. I had didn't know this before doing this research for this presentation, but the census did not count Hispanic populations separately until 1980. So they would have been counted in, as a, a, a white 
a white person in from the 40s to the 70s. So that's why that color pops up so strongly in the 80s through 2019. Um, I also want to say too, this is not to say that having Having all the colors spread together looks great. We love this. I think the conversation we're having today is not necessarily to say that having integrated communities is bad. It's really to say um, we need to be mindful of, of, of a cultural narrative that's been lost through this change and through these years of development and, and growth. So that's really what we're gonna be centering the conversation on today. Um, and I think we'll move into the next slide to show some of examples of that cultural narrative that is getting lost to development. So you know, if I can make some assumptions based on the maps that we've just shared, um, as wealthier people of color were moving out of the city, that really left a vulnerable community in their place. And as development pressure, as those economic forces move from the west towards the east, we see a lot of um, homes being raised. So like the Charles Barnes house on the left, um, significant structures that are being lost to development or just lost to change in general. So Hillside Drugs, um, that is now called Hillside Pharmacy. That was a, that was a center of the community. That was the local drug store and, and where, where folks would meet and greet. And it's been, that story or that narrative has largely been lost um, through a revisioning of, of this neighborhood. Um, churches are one of the last things in some of our preparation conversations for this panel tonight. That was one of the things we talked about being probably the last signal to go because many families who moved outside of East Austin would still continue to come back on, the, on Sundays to attend church at their family community church. And we now are seeing churches um, sell their properties, move further out to be closer to their um, to their parishioners, and you know this is this is a sign that there's been a, a, a big loss in in a community's history and heritage. The the last slide that I'm going to end on is one that I think really cues us up for the conversation tonight. So this is a this is a map that was developed by one of my colleagues in the AIA Urban Design Committee, Julio Creo. Um, he had put this together just to as a study to research what was happening with ADUs in Austin. And so um, he researched to dig up building permit applications starting from 2007 through current day and mapped those and then developed a heat map to see where those are mostly centered. And I think what this map does and why I wanted to include it in this overview is to say, this is truly a vulnerable place for development and also a hotbed where affordable housing is needed. So we're, we're seeing all these things come together. Um, this map very clearly shows that that's happening. It's been happening, will continue to happen. And as designers and architects here in the room, um, we have the ability to help both preserve a community's heritage and amplify their story, but also make an attempt to provide more affordable housing options, both for folks who want to live here who don't yet, and for those who already live here and want to continue to live here. So that's really the heart and soul of what our conversation is going to be about tonight. Um, it's going to be juicy. I'm excited. I'm really excited to hear what questions you all may have for our panelists. Um, I think with that, we're going to start digging into the brains of these four brilliant women. Um, I hope that they've had a little time to simmer and, and get their thoughts organized. <laughs> Hopefully they haven't been playing uh, Minecraft or something in this intro period. <laughs> I'm sure they're all ready to go. Um, we're gonna start by, by um, talking with Pamela. So Pamela, I was curious if you don't mind fielding this first question for us. Um, so you know that you're sitting in a room with a lot of architects and designers, folks who are you know, um, very intimately tied to development. Um, and my assumption is that they're here because they're, they're also concerned and they're interested in wanting to know what they can do, what their part is in, in continuing uh, to be respectful to the communities that they're working, on, working in. So do you have any thoughts on how developers and designers can amplify the culture and history narrative of a community that they're working in? And I'd love to hear if you have any examples of where you've seen that um, being done well. Absolutely. Let me first say um, respect to Mayor Pro Tem Harper Madison. Amazing job. And I learn something every time I hear from her. 
And Mindy, I want to say this to you in real time that your uh, startup into this conversation tonight and your stu and, and studying the history was really impeccably done. And having said that, I will say that I am absolutely not an architect nor a developer. Um, so I'm, I'm loving being in this space. But what I will say to you is as I am interfacing with developers all the time, because in the cultural arts district, um, that happens a lot. I mean, gentrification is real, uh, sprawl and growth is real. I would say one of the first things I say is exactly what I just honored you for, which is know the history, right? That becomes a tool so that when you are entering into a community for which you might not know the history, um, you then become part of the narrative around um, that storyline. So I always say that. Then I always talk about the fact that when you are going to be in that space, when you're in a development space and you come and saying, I'm getting ready to you know, um, build something, if you would simply think of it as a co-creation of something, it would change the dynamic of, um, I think, even how you creatively approach it. And so when you think about the fact that, you know, now when I use the word affordability with my constituents, there is an automatic um, wall that goes up, right? I've had to try to figure out other ways to say affordability because it has a very negative connotation. I say that because we've almost used that in a way that is diminishing and feels like an appendage. So when you think about this idea around affordability, uh, the willingness to be able to really embrace that, um, you got to have the data, but you also need to know the stories of the community for which you are about to try to um, do something in. And so that becomes really uh, important to approach. And you need to walk into a community that you don't know with whatever I think it is, that's not it. Because you don't know. And so if you wanna really tick off a group of people really fast, come in thinking you know, and or start discussing your history from your 20, 20, you know, 2015 viewpoint. Um, and I say all that in both as the you know, ED of Six Square and also a product of the East Side. So my husband and I would still be on the East Side today if we could afford to be. So we are the... We are the quintessential push out to the suburbs family. Can I ask um, a very naive question, Pamela, which is, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks here who are well-intentioned and would want to do that. Where do they start? How do they find these stories? Where, you know, how do you dig into the history when you don't know where to start? We have living legends on the ground, on, on foot in East Austin. Right. And so one of the hubs that has been lost in the, in the, and the vibe of East Austin is a lot of the civil rights and a lot of desegregation and a lot of mobilization happened in the hubs of the churches. And I can't say that enough and we're kind of losing th that ground, but I would say, you know, the, the research around um, the history, you should ask yourself what else could be true and what else do I not know? Um, and I think those become big questions. And so when I think about, I think um, our mayor pro Tim mentioned Willie Mae Kirk, but I could name people, you know, Reverend Freddie Dixon, who is a walking encyclopedia, still lives on the east side. Uh, Rivers, Richard Overton has passed on, but his family is here. So when I think about like opportunities to learn, it becomes what is beyond the narrative. Um, but a good start um, we have a, li a living storyteller, Harrison Epright, who's at Visit Austin, but he also does our East Austin tour. Six Square does a tour. Um, take it and ask questions. And don't just ask how this got here now. Ask what was here before. That quickie pick was not the quickie pick. That nice coffee shop where you're getting your cappuccino and your latte was an automobile, you know, was an automotive store. Like, 
those things get lost. So when I see things like, you know, Hillside Ph Pharmacy, I'm not thrilled about it because there's a narrative that gets lost. So please come and sit and ask questions. And I think sometimes what happens from a, a true, you know, uh, learning perspective is we get afraid to ask the question. I don't want to offend. I don't want to overstep. And we have to get over that. You, you will repeat what you, you know, don't repair. And repair requires deeper conversation, courageous conversations, hard questions, and pausing for the answer. That's wonderful. I love, I love that what else could be true. That's a really great, I mean, honestly, that applies to all of life, doesn't it? But um, yeah, I really appreciate that, that response. Um, and a great cue up, I think, for a question I was going to send Donna's way, which was about preserving preserving architectural history and heritage. And this is something that's near and dear to her heart and practice. And I'm curious, Donna, if you had any thoughts on this. Um, are the goals of preserving architectural history and, and building affordable housing at odds with each other? Or can they support each other? What do you think? You're muted. you'll never hear me is put me on mute. Um, it, they're not at odds, but I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem really hit, hit it on the head. You have to be intentional. And if you think about the, um, the plan of 1928, that infamous plan, it was, um, there was a graphic that went with it there was housing stock that was going to be there. There were things that were built, but the reality of it was there was a policy that was behind it. And that's what we haven't seen. So even though I will agree and have agreed, whether it's through um, Code Next, whether it's through the comments here tonight that we need, you know, we don't need to have 6,000 square foot prop, you know, you know, uh, lots and, and um, you know, with, with one house on it. I agree with all that, but without the policy that says, and that incentivizes actually keeping the rent lower, what we have is what we see in East Austin today, where we have the, the even some small lots divided into three and four as condos, each one of those very small footprint very small lot size, but selling for a very high price. And this actually gets into other policies that we're thinking about. And even though it's not really the topic of conversation, but, but one that again, putting our guilt aside, putting um, really the political rhetoric around um, aside, we have to think about the policies that we put in place for all of our social, our, our servants. And that's going to be police, it's going to be mental health, it's going to be social services, those social services, how those things get pushed out. And for me as a planner, what I wanna see is us to use um, technological solutions from, um, from the 23rd century. I mean, they, sh they should be out there. But what we need to do use is a community base that's really quite small. It might be, it is that quarter mile walking distance. It is the elementary school planning catchment area. It is that small district that becomes something that is this, that, that's close to home. So if I can use the technologies of Amazon or use the technologies of, of a Walmart to deliver the logistics to deliver something, then I can have boots on the ground. It might be the local post person. It might be, um, you know, it, it, you know, those are the welfare checks. Those are the things we do. So, so from a design point of view, from a planning point of view, how do I do these things? You know, I, I, I want them to be beautiful. I want them to have things on the way to look at. I want to inter integrate art with that. I, I want those houses to be sustainable. I want all of those things, but I want the policies behind those to be supportive for the families that are within. So, I mean, I think that that's one thing, but I can't help but go back to some of the things that, that, that Pam was saying. Um, in terms of the stories, the, 
we think of history with a big H. And with the big H, we're looking for those big milestones. And yes, we'll look at brown, brown, be uh, brown. We um, will, you know, we, we look at an assassination. We look at all the things that we can kind of, uh, you say, this happened, and, and then we can tell that story. What we have in East Austin and what as African Americans and as most marginalized communities often lose, is how all these stories are interwoven. How the fact that we had a resilient education system that we 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 taught and then nurtured and bred and um, actually multiplied educators that cared about the next generation. We had men in, and women in military service that served both abroad, but then had to face the indignities of home. That you can draw, I mean, on my computer, there's GIS of mapping where that happened, the houses that occurred, the, 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 the educators that didn't turn their, tourist ha their house into a tourist home for money, but because that was a support for the community. So when you look at the green book, when you look at the A guide and, and, and um, where those homes were, those stories start to overlap one another. So one, you know, so, and, and those two things really are related in the sense that we, we need as a community to say those stories are important that small house that shows how that tourist home function is something that is worthy of saving. And that um, it's, you know, we've gotten to the point that we, we fight some very large historic preservation battles. And as we fight those large battles, we turn around and look within the community and each one of those houses, you know, Loving Goods House is gone. Um, you know, some of the other educators, they're all gone. It's lot by lot by lot. And that's how we, we kind of lose that, you know, those pieces. Um, and as professionals, we need to be able to bolster our, um, you know, our, our, our uh, you know, staff people, our elected officials in showing how, how the policies really can work and to give them the words and the tools so that they're not political policies. These are, these are policies that we're saying, these are our values as a community. And this is what we are going to, you know, this, this is what we want to, to uplift. And, and I think it's, it's possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think yeah, <laughs> totally. I, Pamela's clapping, and I'm I'm right there with her. I, I you know, there's obviously a lot of layers. Policy is part of it. Um, the dollars are part of it too. Uh, you know, so I and I'm and I'm kind of pinging around all of my different panelists. I will say too. I just want to remind all of you if there's something that any panelist says that you want to chime in on, please feel free to do so. I want this to be an open conversation. Um, but I do want to, I want to build on that idea of, of policy and then also layer on the financial realities of staying in a home. You know, when, when you see homes like that get lost to pressures, um, policy does let it happen. And so does, um, so does economic pressures on a community. Um, but that's so, tax code, which is also policy. There you go. Um, see, and, you're smarter than me. <laughs> and, and, and it is state tax code. And right. And, and uh, clearly Austin has issues with the state. You know, they don't necessarily like some of the things that we want to do. Um, and then we have misused that. So there is also distrust within the community um, when the city says, you're gonna do this, but the only way through that, you know, is a lien on the property or an easement or something that really makes it sound like it's gonna be taken away. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, you're, you're, you're totally, you're totally on it, Donna. That's, that's entirely, thank you for, for making that um, clarification. And, and I, so I'm going to, I'm going to ping, I'm going to ping Sonia because I know that this is, we're getting into tax, we're getting into co tax code and laws, which uh, 
you might be the, I think you're our expert on this panel in that regard. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what, what thoughts do you have to, to add to that conversation? You know, this idea of rising taxes, forcing families off of their land, which opens up, you know, opens up opportunity for development and change and the loss of narrative. What, what has your experience been or what are, what are the ways that that can change or what have you seen? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm from California. Well, I'm from Philadelphia, but I live in California. I work in California. I'm active in politics out here. And, um, you know, we, as rumor has it, that a lot of the, re like a lot of new people coming to Austin are coming from California. So I think it's very important. You know, I'm, I feel very lucky that I have the opportunity to be here because we need to be um, thinking about housing policy across municipal lines and it turns out across state lines, you know, as it turns out, decisions being made in San Francisco and in LA are impacting you here, you know? So I really do, before I answer this excellent question, which has to do with, you know, California has a very um, unusual way of uh, having tried to deal with this problem um, that was good in some ways and bad in others. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really wanna invite people to feel very free to get in touch with city councils in California. You know, if you feel mad, if you like encounter some Californian and you're like, you're ruining my town, do it. And it is the, you might think, what do they care? I'm so far from their city, but they really, really need to hear from people all over the country because decision makers are making decisions here and they're very parochial. You know, they're really like, can't see past the end of their noses. Um, anyway. So yeah, so you may already know, you may not. We have this crazy thing in California called Prop 13. Um, and in the 1970s, um, housing prices were going up a lot um, for a number of reasons, I guess, um, which meant that property taxes were going up a lot. And uh, a guy named Howard Jarvis, and I guess others, they organized something called the Taxpayers Revolt. And so they passed Prop 13. And so the way that property taxes work in California is, when you buy your house, um, your property tax rate is no more than 1% of the amount you paid for the house when you bought it. And then after that, your property taxes cannot go up more than 2% a year. So it's like supposed to be like kind of with inflation, but no more than 2%. So as you can imagine, I mean, house values are going up everywhere, but, you know, but especially in California, way faster than 2% a year. And so people are paying um, property taxes, you know, on these like 1978 values, 1985 values. Uh, so the downsides are that it really was great for taxpayers, you know, but it was terrible for the state. It is in particular it bankrupted um, the school system. And so schools are now not really funded locally. They're funded from, you know, the state. And it's still, um, it still is a big impact on the state budget because property tax revenues are typically a lot less variable than income tax revenues or business tax revenues were totally reliant on business taxes. So a lot of people don't like it because of that. Um, the, the other downside is that it doesn't, it interrupts like the feedback loop, you know, like a lot of people want their property values to go up, but they, uh, you know, if their property taxes are going up too, then they might actually, maybe you would get homeowners sort of interested in housing shortage issues. And here in California, homeowners are just like completely checked out of that. Um, on the other hand, oh, and the final thing is, is that this is kind of the most important thing I think for this conversation. Um, another downside is that it creates a lot of resentment because we were trying to solve a real problem, which is a problem you know people are mentioning in the chat, um, which is that people on fixed incomes um, or people, you know, who moved in a little while ago before the neighborhood changed were being forced out. And that's definitely a bad thing, something we have to address. Um, but the benefits of Prop 13 are kind of just diffuse. They're just to like every older person, whether they need it or not, you know? So high income people and low income people are getting this tax cut. And, and new people who are trying to buy a house and start their lives obviously are paying way more taxes than the incumbent residents. And, you know, for a new person who's like relatively lower income, just because like the younger people are always relatively lower income, there's a lot of resentment. Um, 
So I think that it's, I bring it up, but the upside of course is it genuinely did protect a lot of people from having to sell their house, move, go to tax foreclosure. I mean, obviously. And it really is, I mean, it along with uh, rent control creates a lot of income um, integration in our communities in California, you know? I, like there are many downsides to gentrification, but, being displaced by high taxes is just not one of them in California. Um, thank God. Um, so, uh, you know, I do, I, my solution, the thing that I'm starting to ask for um, in our political advocacy and what I really would like people to start thinking about here is means tested property taxes, right? Like we do it in other ways all the time. A lot of cities will do stuff like they'll say, okay, a tax break for people over 55, or if you're in certain incomes and yeah, you're over a certain age or whatever. But these are all noisy ways of getting at what we really want to get at. What we really want to get at is if you can't afford your property taxes, then you just shouldn't have to pay them. Like the idea, I mean, property taxes are basically like rent that you pay to the government. You know what I mean? And if we want to have, so if you had a building and it was going to be an income integrated building, obviously everyone would be paying different rent, It'd be, you know, even if they had very similar apartments. So if you want an income integrated neighborhood and you want ownership, you know, you're not only trying to achieve income integration by being like, well, high income people will own and will have renters and they'll be the low income. Like if you really want real integration and you want lower income people to still be able to buy a house. I feel like it's obvious, you know, not everybody's going to be paying the same property taxes. So this idea that property taxes, um, you know, need to be based on like the property value um, because neighborhood values all move together. You know, there are some neighborhoods that are like closer to transit, you know, they're going to be more attractive. Um, if you are constantly tying property taxes only to land value, um, then you're sort of guaranteeing that you're it's going to be a lot harder to get the income integration, you know, that you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so that thanks makes for letting so me much go sense. on. That makes I so much really sense. <laughs> it makes so much sense. And it's still, it's like mind blowing for me to consider that as a method of, of yeah, it, that's a really <laughs> awesome thought. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I don't know, um, if any of the panelists want to weigh in on that, I'm, my brain is going to be computing what that means or what that would mean for Austin for a minute. But if anyone wants to chime in on that, um, feel free to. I just want to say the road to whatever that is from a tax perspective is a long one because I got a call today from a longtime resident who is paying more in taxes and they pay their house is paid off, who's paying more in taxes and they pay for their house. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking about generational legacy building and well, like, so you can't, you're, then your grandkids can't afford that. And so, and your kids can't afford that. So that's a, that's a huge piece. And to the point about kind of this whole uh, upswing with people coming here and it's you know, really dense and populated when homes are going for $104,000 over asking price, we have a significant significant problems. So it will not be repaired overnight. That is going to be a long haul course correction. Yeah, that, that is completely, that is a completely fair point. And Sonia, I don't know if you have any quick thoughts or if there's intermediate steps to getting to that process, because you're right, Pamela, it's not, that's, it's not overnight. Yeah, the um, immediate intermediate steps, I guess, based on other places are going to be things like tax breaks for older people. You know, I, you may even probably I have that. It sounds like um, from uh, what Donna was talking about, that you might have a program where they let you uh, defer your taxes until point of sale. Maybe even just removing those. I think those are actually very unfair, too, because basically all things being equal, you know, two people inheriting a house. If your parents were higher income, then they were paying their taxes the whole time. Um, and if, but you know, if your parents were lower income, then you have to pay a lot of money to inherit your house. Like that's not, that's not no, gonna the, help us like, you know, maintain diversity. Right, there's, there's been a, um, a slight um, push into um, having a preser for historic properties and um, preservation oh. areas that um, you would get 
essentially some, some tax breaks based on that. The paperwork to set that up has been difficult. And we, as I said, um, there have also been, um, you know, whether it's improvements so that you can keep your house and keep your house up to standards, all of those kinds of things. We, we have a very bad track history in this city in terms of um, treating the homeowner during that process. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a little like, um, you know, where we are with the vaccines, people say, I just, I don't trust the government on it. I, just, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. So we, we, I mean, there's that aspect. I think that's overcomable if you have some good policies, um, policies in place. But, um, but, but the reality of it is it's going to come down to incentivizing the developers um, to, to actually subsidize certain aspects of adding inventory so that we can actually, and in some ways, I think part of what we're going to need to do is kind of inventory average, if that's a term that could be used in terms of finally figuring out what, you know, how many, what units we have um, that are going to be available, what that value has been over time, and then what that tax base really needs to be for the city to go forward and then how the incentives would break out. So it really is kind of disaggregating some of the activities. And that's a hard sell. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not a politician. I don't know how you do that. Um, I just think somebody needs to think about it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that thought. And I think you, you touched on something that's really critically important, Donna, which is there is a distrust and, I, and for good reason, there's distrust of, um, government, um, and, and particularly on the east side. I mean, the history there tells a story that builds distrust, and I think there's some of that that is needing to be overcome. Um, and I know we've all seen it. I'm Trinity, you've been so patient and quiet, and I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to, to speak to your experience as well. Um, you know, and I, I specifically, you know, you've spent time on, on planning commission. You've seen cases come before you that I'm, I'm sure challenge everything that we've talked about tonight. Um, and I'm curious if you if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit to our current land development code. I know we've we've touched on we're right now operating for a code from a code that was developed in the early 80s. The city has changed just a little bit since that point in time. Um, so I would love to hear your perspective on um, how that current land development code and our state policies have contribute contributed to the current affordability and cultural preservation crisis that we're seeing right now. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for having me on this panel. I'm so humbled to be here with such powerhouses and dynamites. And I um, second pretty much all of the sentiments that have been said before I've spoken. I think um, just really quick, just to touch back on that property taxes. So I think I'll start with kind of your question about the state policies. That property tax piece is, is a huge hurdle for us in, in the city. Um, particularly because of with those, just like everybody was saying, Mayor Pro Tem and Sonia, that those increased property taxes do essentially push you out of a home that you may have owned for generations. And because our property taxes are based on the potential value of your land, when we do um, increase the zoning and the ability to build more units on one piece of property, we're inadvertently increasing the property taxes on that same comparable property next to it, which then in turn pushes those low and middle income homeowners out. So there is a, um, a real balance and a real, um, we have to be more nuanced in the way that we apply our increased density across our city. And we have to take more care on how we do that. Um, I would say sticking with the state policies, the other piece that does us know, that does us a disservice is the fact that Texas is the only state in our country that doesn't allow its municipalities to mandate affordability, which essentially means that our city's hands are completely tied when it comes to mandating developers to 
do affordable housing and multifamily and such. So what that leaves us with is um, a complex system of density bonuses. So we use these density bonuses to try to incentivize developers to apply affordable housing to their projects in exchange for maybe more floor to area ratio, more height, more um, units per square foot. Um, but right now our density bonuses are every single density bonus in town is completely different from every other one. So it's extremely complex. It's been layered over you know, the last 35 years of just layering and layering and layering. They're very inconsistent. And to be completely honest, they are not working in the majority of the situations where they're used. So we have TODs that are being built out with very little affordability because they don't need to take the affordability bonus. They're getting enough um, units just out of the, the buy right zoning that they have. So touching back on kind of that complexity piece of the puzzle, I think the other place where our um, land development code is, is really lacking is that because we have all of these layers and these overlays, it's so difficult for the regular lay person to navigate the code that even being able to understand what you can do with your property right now by right is extremely difficult. So I have people that come to me and hire me just to decipher what the code says, just to get them through the front door of figuring out, can they even do a project on their property? Um, that makes it really difficult, not only for the single family homeowners, but also for multifamily homeowners. Um, I think also that that complexity and kind of all of this compounding of, of just hurdles also makes it difficult for banks to understand what they're financing. So we have a system here in Texas where when you have two homes on one property, you get penalized by the bank and trying to come back and take some equity out of those homes becomes extremely difficult because the bank doesn't really understand what this ownership structure looks like. So from a, you know, from a city standpoint, I think that we could be doing more to have more conversations with the institutions about how they could better be supporting um, the homeowners on the ground as well. That, yeah, uh, that's brilliant. And, I, and a really good point to make, um, you know, I think until I had heard you talk about it, I had not really thought about the, the fact that state policy is really what, what pushes the incentivization of, of density programs. Um, you know, I've, I, and I'm sure we, most of us on this panel and many of us on the call have operated with density bonus programs throughout our careers. And, um, you know, that is an incredibly powerful force on how our city is approaching affordability right now. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that information and adding that layer that um, may or may not be uh, in the front of most of our attendees' minds. It certainly wasn't for mine. Um, and I'm curious too, because you went through this process, um, you know, we did have a code next proposal that now became the land development code rewrite. How would that have changed our trajectory? And, and, you know, I know that we're in a bit of a stalemate right now with moving that process forward, but what do you see as the potential benefits of, of having that, um, become a reality and, and, is, and do you think it's possible? <laughs> Well, I do think it's possible. I think that it has to happen, that we do have to rewrite our code and tackle it. It's extremely overwhelming and daunting, um, but it, we cannot continue to, to hobble down the road with this Frankenstein code that we've created over the last 35 years. We have to start digging through it and making hard decisions and pushing forward. Um, I would say that there are a number of things that the current rewrite is getting correct, is getting right. And the first one would be the, um, and Mayor Pro Tem spoke to this a little bit, the implementation of, of missing metal, which is adding more opportunities for um, duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes, so that we do have um, some zoning that actually captures that in between in between your single family and in between your large multifamily. That we don't have a zoning for that right now in our current code. And that 
um, the creation of those zones in the land development code will allow us to have more opportunities for those kinds of units, which really do make a difference in the fabric of affordability and the um, the linking of those affordable types of units to the resources that we already have. I think the biggest piece with that is that taking that type of zoning and applying it to the city needs to be done with care and nuance as, as Donna was speaking to, that if we just kind of blanket, apply that across the city blanket and um, without much attention to what's actually happening on the ground, we run the risk of just exacerbating the existing problem and further pushing gentrification out. So part of, of this question of equity is how do we apply those new housing types to parts of town that have not bared the brunt of development as much as the east side has? How do we make sure that when we're putting those in, that we're putting them into parts of town that can actually take on that additional density and have the infrastructure. Right now we're using, um, in the land rewrite, we're using transition zones as a way of kind of implementing some of that um, density. That transition zones, just as a quick overview, we have the Imagine Austin corridors, then from those corridors, that's where we put the most dense and the most commercial, then we step back in density, back, back, back into your single family. The way those have been applied across the city right now um, take about four different criteria into consideration. Whereas when we were on, when I was on planning commission, we had about 16 different criteria that we were using to implement, including street widths, whether there are sidewalks, um, whether there's a school around, some real hard looks at what connectivity actually looks like. Do are there stop signs? Is it just yield? Those types of things. Um, make a big difference in how that zoning can actually be um, applied and how it actually works out on the ground. The, in terms of um, density bonuses, right now in the code, in the land development rewrite, there's the equity area affordable housing density bonus. And this is a density bonus that's specifically laid out across East Austin and the idea was that this would be a density bonus that would help to alleviate some of the um, burden of taking on this new, um, the increased density basically on the inside, to, on the east side to try to balance out the gentrification. The main issue with this and with the other density bonuses is that they're targeting 80% MF medium family income, MFI, and 60% medium family income. In the city of Austin right now, or for 2020, that puts us at um, $55,000 for a single person at 80% MFI and $41,000 a year income for 60%, or $62,000 for 80% two family, $57,000 for single family. That is targeting our basically like our veteran um, teachers, our seasoned firefighters, that's hitting those kind of average salaries. What it's not hitting is our brand new teachers. It's not hitting our brand new EMS drivers. It's not hitting our $12 an hour workers. So if we are actually trying to do something with these density bonuses, we have to look at targeting a, a medium family income that's actually going to affect the people that need this the most, looking at 40% MFI, 30% MFI. Um, also, I think that because that the state is holding our hands, those density bonuses, um, those that is all of our carrots. So if we zone, we can literally zone our, up zone our way out of these density bonuses. And so I think that, um, in places like where we have the equity area affordable housing bonus on the east side specifically, we need to look at almost taking a step back from the zoning so that we do have some room to negotiate those density bonuses so that we actually do have some carrots to work with. If we give it all away, there's nothing left. We have no sticks. Do I think the land development code is gonna get um, put through? I, God, I hope so. <laughs>
<laughs> I hope my my real hope and and I don't know if if Mayor Pro Tem is still on the call or not, but my hope is that um, that regardless of which way it happens with the lawsuit, that the actual zoning, that the actual um, writing of the zone, the rewriting of the code will be implemented and tweaked as it needs to be. And then we could use the mapping as a future land use map, as a flum, that mm -hmm. we could continue to tweak and continue to have conversations and to have the more difficult conversations that we really haven't had the opportunity to. And use that that flum as an opportunity to allow people to plug into the future zoning while allowing the rest of the city to kind of organically come into its own yeah because people are are scared of having a blanket zoning spread across so let's ease into it but we got to do something we got to start yeah forward. yeah and you know i think too i mean i guess the argument of um having more time not that I, you know, I know, I know a lot of us are just eager to see change, um, but I guess there is some opportunity for us to have conversations like these um, and think about what it takes to get a community to change course, um, you know, and, and boy, it's, it's like turning a cruise ship, you know, in the night. So, um, and the next question that I had queued up, I, I really, I had this, um, had Sonia in mind for it, but I think I'd be really curious to get all of your input on it. So, um, Sonia, if you want to speak to it first, then we'll open it up for, for other input, but, but kind of getting at that at that um, critical factor of getting um, getting change to happen in a city that has, I mean, we've had some really strong political standpoints on one end of the spectrum and the other. And so, you know, I know through UMB Action, that's definitely something that Sonia has had experience working with. And so I'm, I'm curious about how um, that was dealt with in, in your experience, Sonia. Yes, you know, a lot of times change here and, and what I've seen in our community is that um, the change in land develop development code is seen as a, a threat. Um, and so that's really what generates a lot of resistance. Folks don't want, you know, they don't want to be blanket blanketed, like Trinity said, into one category, but they also, I think there's some just resistance to the unknown um, and, and just resistance to change in general, let's be frank. Um, so I was curious if you have any thoughts on how our communities can be encouraged to embrace this change, um, you know, to, to, to welcome more density um, and to do that in a way that gives them reassurance that um, history is going to be preserved and, you know, that we can approach a new way of living and, and working together that meets all of those needs. I and mean, it's like the impossible question. That's the one that we've all been plaguing ourselves with here for the last couple of years in Austin, but I'd, I'd love to hear your outsiders thoughts on it. And then if any, Donna, Trinity, Pam, Natasha, I would love to get your thoughts on that as well. And Donna's um, raising her hand, she's eager. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, uh, so what the first thing is, you know, to address the real, the like the real concrete um, bad impacts of change, you know, like my, therapists may tell you, you may have had this where they, they tell you there's a difference between pain and suffering, you know, pain is like an emotional reaction. Um, but suffering is like, you know, starving, like something that's like really happening to your body. So Donna actually in the chat was talking about, um, you know, requiring, uh, affordable units to be replaced if they're removed. That's actually something that we do have in California. We finally passed it, uh, I guess last year. And it's super important because if you have, you don't want people to be evicted because of new building coming, right? Like that's suffering. That's like a real um, trauma to their, you know, to their life, their lifestyle, especially, you know, if you're low income, you don't know where else you're gonna go um, or you have to leave your neighborhood. So making sure that you have, yeah, we have tenant protecting demolition controls. Basically, if you have households that are making 80% AMI or below, area median income or below, and you propose to tear down, you know, their apartment, um, you have to replace it and uh, give them an opportunity, that household an opportunity to return. Uh, so it can be done, we, you know, we have it. Um, and then the other thing was something that we've, so I'll tell you, I mean, the way that it worked out here insofar as we're ever able to advocate for change, it's really just straightforward politics. It's getting all the people together who all agree with each other um, getting some talking points and making sure that we're visible, you know, because 
homeowners that are like only, uh, you know, motivated by nostalgia or, you know, actually motivated much worse, like by straight out racism. I mean, we were looking at the maps earlier. You, you guys have a, I mean, like all cities, you have a low density, high income, mostly white area, like propose putting apartment buildings there. It's not just nostalgia that's going to bring them out, you know, and they're going to dominate those meetings unless people that disagree with them show up too. So sometimes it's just like getting more warm bodies in a room. Um, but the other thing is that's really important is recognizing the pain, you know, when it's happening, like sometimes when you might, sometimes the right thing to do is still a hard thing to do. And in our lives and other areas of our lives, we have ways of processing loss um, and talking about it, you know, and in land use, there really is no way of processing that um, except just organizing to stop change. You know, there's no, there's not that, there's no really like venue for being, yeah, for funeral for like having a funeral for a feeling. Um, but the other way actually is the historical preservation way. And so having, I think that especially architects here, one of the things you can do, um, Donna has spoken before about, um, uh, and maybe this isn't what you meant to be um, conveying, but what I was hearing is that, you know, you might preserve a building and that might not be enough. Like that's kind of the first step. You also want to make sure that the people in community know why it's being preserved. Like, what's the point of it? Like, um, so that is an active process, right? Like some of these, you know, you have um, tours that you were talking about, but you know, there there needs to be like docents for some of these buildings, and that's you know a volunteer uh, uh, activity. Um, but continuing in an ongoing way to be like talking about, you know, the, the, the history of the city and the parts of the city is healthy. I guess, sorry, to, I'll finish up. But no, you know what I mean? Like you have to have a place for respecting the past if you think that anybody's gonna be able to agree to let go of parts of the past. Donna, did you wanna build on that? You're muted, so. Yes. and and. Kind of a, a, a quick history, if, if anyone wants, if we ever get back into, you know, doing things um, in person, you know, go to the History Center, there's a copy of a plan that I did in 1983 for East 11th and 12th Street. And um, it was a huge master plan with design guidelines. It had, you know, historic districts, kind of the whole nine yards. But part of that really talked about, first of all, um, I didn't call it that, but it was form-based code. Um, it was incremental um, densification. And so if you think about the transition areas now, you think about how do we get from you know, point A to point B, even if we start talking about, especially with people that want to stay or people that want the right to return to their ancestral um, sites. Um, if you can, if you can get with these protections, three units or four units on that, that's still an increase in density. That still provides a unit that could be rented out with rings in. So it doesn't have to be uh, four over concrete, you know, brand new, huge mixed use thing. So, I mean, so for me, that incremental growth, and I've got a zillion, you know, sketch up sketches of how you put, you know, three or four, five units behind a historic, you know, a house that you want to retain some historic character in the front. Street doesn't look a whole lot different. Um, we can park some cars and then you say we want to get transit in because those streets are going to be overrun. It's our infrastructure that's not going to be able to take this. It mm -hmm. is our urban runoff. It is our sidewalks. It's our streets. And, it, and that is all going to be put on its head when we come out of the other end of this pandemic. Let's, I mean, that's just a whole nother webinar. Um, <laughs> So I think that's one thing. You're absolutely right, Sonia. My deal is these are, these are not only the stories, but this is absolutely the foundation. And it's why the, the three and four and five year, it's why, why my granddaughter can say she's proud of this. 
This is why she can go into that third grade autobiography and doesn't stare at a blank sheet because she really doesn't know where all the pieces of her family fit in. And that was, that was people's experience for, I mean, for centuries, for, you know, a century, for generations. So, and, um, and to me, that is what you're developing. You're developing the art and the culture that can then be in these small buildings, that can start to be a venue, can be a place for an artist, that can produce the, you know, a plaque is a simple way of doing it, but can, can produce the evocative piece that starts to tie these pieces together. This is the, the how do you add on to this with, and I love modern architecture. If I'm gonna pick a style, it's gonna be modern and it may be even too modern. But when I'm coming into a neighborhood, there's some way that I have got to allude to what that neighborhood was. Um, and I have to become some kind of good neighbor. And I have to say that I am a guest in your house. And these are, these are, these are hard because architects and developers, the one thing we all have in spades is ego. And so that's a, that's a, that's a really hard sidewalk to go down. Yeah, it definitely is, Donna. And I, you know, and I think too, there's, um, you know, Texas is a property rights straight state too. And so I think there is sort of this inherent concept of ownership of this is my land, I do with it what I please. Um, or at least in, as an outsider, having moved here 17 years ago, that's something that I think is somewhat unique to Texas, um, probably unique to the United States in general, but other communities don't look at it that way. Like this land is our land, right? And not necessarily my land. And that's definitely a perspective that I think we're coming, uh, you know, head to head with and with the land development code rewrite is, um, you know, I, I see that being a, a lightning rod of conversation um, for a lot of the, the resistance to changing code there. Um, and Trinity, I don't know if I, I saw you raise your hand and I, I don't know if that's um, where you were headed um, thinking about changing people's perspectives in that regard, but I'd love to hear what your, your thoughts were. Um, I did just two things quickly. One, um, there is a, per, a preservation incentive within the new rewrite, and it doesn't go nearly far enough, I think. I think there's more work to be done in there, and I think there's more ways that it could be um, used as a foundation and applied in, in more circumstances. But the concept is that you would, if you retain um, the original structure on the house and a certain amount of its frontage. So I think it's something like if you retain, um, I'm going to get the numbers completely wrong, but I think it's something along the lines of if you retain the first 30 feet of, of frontage of the original structure and scale, then you're allowed a small bonus for a back structure. So the idea being that if you preserve not only this, the character, the human scale um, of this front structure, but also this is where our natural, our naturally according, uh, naturally occurring affordability happens in our older structures, in our smaller cottages. They are our affordable housing already. So if you can retain that and then do a larger um, accessory dwelling unit, garage apartment, whatever you want to call it, alley flat in the back, you are. Um, helping to kind of preserve the place a little bit um, and hopefully preserving some of that natural occurring affordability. In terms of, I, I can see that there's other hands, so I don't wanna go too long, but in terms of, of um, selling the code to um, kind of working past the fear of the code, I think that, touching back on what I was saying, I think that there are ways that we could implement the code in increments that would greatly cut down on that fear and could be more equitable in the way that they're implemented and um, and I guess implemented with 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 more handholding and less of here this is what you have now 
Mm. Um, and, and certainly doing a future land use map, certainly yeah. having a, a rollout as we go through it, having an, op, an opt in period so that people could say, yes, I do want that. All of all half of our city wants that zoning that you're offering us right now. Great. You guys get it. The other half of the city that's not ready yet. Let's talk about how to get you there. Let's talk about what that looks like and how we how we start making those steps. So baby, baby steps. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, Natasha Harper Madison, your hand is raised. What, what how how would you like to chime into this conversation? It is and because y'all are recording. I'm gonna let you see real fast while my camera's off, but then I'm gonna turn it back off. Guys, Aww. I don't feel good. Them. Poor thing. <laughs> but I'm so into this conversation. So I, my ADD is trying to help me keep it simple. But so many things have been said that I'm just so this is this is the conversation. And so I agree that or I appreciate that Miss Donna said, you know, that's a whole nother webinar. So uh, there's a group of elders with whom I had a conversation about the land development code. And one of them said to me, um, you know, one thing I don't appreciate is the narrative that gets introduced and it gets it, people are giving me my narrative. He goes, me and my family weren't displaced. We voluntarily migrated. When the community became a place that had been disinvested in and so, for so long that there was increases in crimes and there was increases in gang activity, we moved because we wanted to. Um, and, and I think that being able to be a part of the conversation, that's relevant too, because then it makes it, then we're not diminishing anybody's experiences with the evolution of their community. Um, the other thing I was going to say was, I wonder if, and I, I, I think a lot about this as it pertains to sustainability in general, I wonder if there's just so much work that we need to do culturally. So for example, getting people out of their big cars, um, driving single occupancy vehicles down the highway, you know, people who, who under no circumstances whatsoever, do they want to be a part of the transit conversation? My mother and I have this conversation. She's like, I'm not riding the bus. I don't have to. I think for her, the, the concept of relying on public transportation, and I think it has, it's a regional thing. I think because she's not from a Philly or a Boston or New York or places that have comprehensive public transit, um, she's like, I, I'm not doing that. And so I just, I wonder if, if, if and where that could be an introduction to the conversation that culturally people thinking, if I, if I don't own a single family house, if I do live in a duplex or some other type, housing type, what does that say about me and my level of success? Or I, I, I think there's some way to massage that conversation and sort of talk people through what it looks like, our evolution into a modern city, what that looks like. And those are some of those things that I don't know that people are ready to have the conversation about. And then the last thing I'll say that I thought about as Trinity was speaking, um, the, the conversation around how to ease people into the concept of, so I think somebody said in the chat, how do I, a layman, enter this conversation? This is not my background or my subject matter expertise. I, as a layman, when I decided to run, one of the things that, that inspired me was looking around and recognizing that these were conversations that I needed to be a part of because I'm a part of this community. And so trying to get involved, I'd go to a planning commission meeting, for example, or I would listen in as the urbanists were having their conversations, or I got invited to, uh, uh, I think it was Austin Neighborhood um, Council meeting. And I'm, I'm listening to these conversations and I recognized that I was saying things that in hindsight, I was like, you know what, my instincts are pretty keen, but I didn't know what I was talking about. I was like, if we could just develop communities that are, you know, community oriented, uh, amenities driven, intentional communities. Now, how that manifests, I don't know, but I was saying that as a layman because I also saw some room to grow there, in which case, I wonder if a big part of this is just involving more people in the conversation that's not, that where we don't other one another so much. Um, I think, you know, but I think watching people be offended, being called NIMBY, or watching them be offended 
having to recognize that they do have some inherent racist ideology to where they don't want new types of neighbors. It, it takes people a minute to work through that. And so I just don't know how long we have is all. I, I don't know if we, if we have enough time to wait for them to come around. I don't know if we have enough time for us to, you know, have a city where as of, you know, a month ago, we had less than a hundred houses in our available housing stock that cost less than a million dollars. Um, that's problematic. In which case, all those things I, I think could probably be said more articulately. Um, but I, I love that we're having this conversation and I love the contribution that everybody's had so far. And I think the evolution of this conversation is gonna be exactly how we get where we need to go. So again, I, I just really appreciate being able to listen in. Man, you are so on point. I, I all of those, I, I really appreciate the note about changing our, our cultural perception, you know, of how we use transit and even our home type. And that's something I don't think I've ever really thought of in quite that way. So I really appreciate that, that idea or that concept that there is um, a changing value system and, you know, that maybe living in a multifamily or more dense way has not always been perceived in our city as um, affluence and that that is maybe running a little bit lagging behind that the perception is lagging behind the reality in some regard so um, you know and it is hard to shift it is hard to shift some of those ideologies um, we definitely have a challenge ahead of us and I would say we don't have time <laughs> we don't have time and we're already behind the ball so whatever we need to do to 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 make it happen I think we all want to see that see that change Pam you've been so patient I would love to hear what you have to contribute to this really great conversation. Well, it is a good conversation. Um, and I'm gonna say that, um, and this is not gonna be, I mean, I'm gonna challenge us on this. And I will say that I don't believe in experts. I don't think there are any, but I'm in my 27th year in DEI work. I taught my first class at Texas A&M through the police department. I've been doing it a long time. Do not let the youthful look, I'm an I'm, I'm elder. I have, I've crossed over, they, they told me last year. And what I will say to you is one of the things that often happens when we start talking about this work around equity is we then deflect to tactical. And I want us to stop a minute because um, Donna had some really significant points. Trinity had some really significant points. And what we do is because we have not been traditionally conditioned to discuss such things, right? We were, we were conditioned, most of us, to not talk about race or politics or religion. It's more about our conditioning. And what happens when we go into this space is it's very easy for us to get into shame, blame, and guilt. And I, I really wanna say to you that are here tonight that that is a, have that for a moment, but then move past it because it is not gonna mobilize us in a way that creates activism and activation and movement. So a lot of times it's like, give me the tactical steps. Well, first of all, there's some healing that needs to be done in this community that nobody wants to talk about. So the I-35 project has started. I'm on that team and I was like, we don't, we're not doing anything until we heal and have hard conversations because we haven't done that. So that's a wound and we keep letting it kind of heal, but there's still bacteria in it so it heals, but it's still puffy. So we're never going to get there because we keep kind of skipping over it. So when it's time to talk about like what, what you can do, what, what is there to do, I cannot stress enough the importance of not diminishing um, the healing that needs to occur, being willing to stay in the ring when the hard conversation comes. And a lot of times that gets fast-tracked, right? And then we can't have conversations about unconscious bias. We can't have conversations about how we're treating our fellow neighbor. We can't have those conversations. We always stop short of having those conversations. And so we, we muddle along, but we don't truly change it. And a lot of that is we skip to tactical and we don't stop and have those really hard conversations. I've been conditioned this way. I'm doing it subconsciously. It has been brought to my attention. I need to behave my way and practice my way to different behaviors. And I just feel like I really need to say that yeah. because we will continue to rotate in this. 
um, when we don't kind of own that. Man, and isn't that's, I mean, that's really at the heart of everything. We, yeah, seriously, that's at the heart of everything that we're talking about tonight. And there's a really hard personal journey in that. That's not something that we necessarily can tackle as a group. I mean, we can we can talk as a group. We can rely on each other as resources. We can have those conversations. But I mean, there's a real deep personal journey there that I think everyone has to take on for themselves as you start digging. You know, I'll be honest, you know, and I can only speak from my own experience, but, I, you know, I came here as an outsider. I'm, I'm a Pennsylvanian, too. Um, like Sonia. And, and when I came here, I had no concept of the history of East Austin. And so in learning that and unraveling that onion and finding out, you know, just learning more about that history, boy, it, it really unraveled some things for me personally. And that was a, that was a tough journey. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think that you're, you're hitting on the right thing. Like that's really where it starts is, is finding a way to have that conversation and it is hard and it's certainly not something we're conditioned to do professionally. Um, I would say as much as we are in our personal lives conditioned to shove all that stuff in a box and not talk about it in our professional worlds, I think even more so. So, um, you know, I really appreciate Oh, I can't hear you. There. Visualize sport first. That's what people are like. Let's mobilize. No, no, no. Self work first. Mm -hmm. Stronger mobilization later. And it's not something that somebody can do for you. Yep. It isn't. It you have to be intentional about it. Yeah, and it's not going to be fun. It's going to hurt a little bit, and you got to. <laughs> Sorry, but that's just but, a fact. And we also have to allow people the space to do it. I mean, there's. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been able to have those conversations because there is a lot of guilt around yep. it. And, um, and that guilt is painful and it's painful on, from all perspectives. And, um, you know, it, it is very real um, that, you know, as we're making these decisions, it often looks like we've, cre we're, baking a pie that is absolutely finite in size and that all we're really doing is carving up and everyone's getting a smaller piece whether it's a smaller house whether it's a smaller amount of money whether it's not enough jobs to go around i mean it doesn't matter the, the pie is still the metaphor and those decreases in what one sees as their basic situation are very real. And until we have that conversation and recognize that that's, that's a reality, that it's a reality when your way of, um, of making a living is going to fundamentally change because of the way the world is fundamentally changing. Um, those are, you know, that's, we, we can't just say, oh, get an education and, and retool. Um, um, we have to understand that's a difficult place for that, that person to be. Um, on the positive side, I'm a carpet bagger too, and I'm way older than anybody put it. all of y'all into a, a cup and add 10 years and, <laughs> and that's my age. So um, I came here from the Northeast where, you know, the church I went to was from 1629 and, and houses all had numbers on them that said, you know, 1724, my zip code was 01776. Um, I came to Austin and it was amazing that there were African-American families that could trace ownership of property at that time, and that was in 1970, back to the early 1900s. And then that family could trace either to Pilot Knob or to a Lydig community that actually went back to tenant farming stage, that went back to literally, you know, runaway slaves that then hid in the woods and, and formed communities. So for me, coming from the Northeast, having that rich landed tradition, it was amazing. Why weren't people celebrating this? 
why weren't, you know, this was something that people should be jumping up and down. It was something that they could really sink their teeth to. And so for me, it is um, the fact that that's here is something that is extremely positive. And that's right next to the Czech heritage. It's right next to the Swedish heritage. It's right next to the Vaccaro and, um, and indigenous people. And when we look at, um, I mean, the story we, you know, it, I'm still trying to unpack what has been fed to me as Hispanic history that is really the history of indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um, on this continent. And so the richness of that, of those tales and what that means about mapping and culture and what that means for our arts, what it means for what we can start to literally sell that, that can come, become another piece of our economy, that can become another piece of who we are, I, to me, the sky's the limit. Um, and if we can get past that guilt, um, we could really celebrate it. That's I have a question for Pam. Um, can you talk more about the venue for the venues for these conversations, right? Like, is it in, it's probably a lot of places, but like in the op-ed pages, um, like the AIA, like should they be hosting, um, a you know, a vent, like a, a space for these kinds of things, like the city council member's office, um, you know what I mean? Can you talk more about the, like where exactly this kind of stuff happens? This It could be a variety of places, but for us, we started with open, open meetings on the radio, our local radio station. And we would hold two hour sessions over time with community leaders to get their perspective on what I-35 meant to them. And, and people were like, I did not realize that it was strategically built to divide the city. So it was a education a moment and a healing moment. And we did several of those, but they can be configured a variety of ways, but I think they're important to convene them. And, you know, I always say to people in this work, it's like the third thing somebody says is warming up toward their real truth because we're not conditioned to do it. So you have to be willing to hang in there. Um, but I truly don't think the way forward is to do it by like, we're gonna blank, we're gonna just make you feel like crap. I just, I'm never gonna subscribe to that. I've never had to do that. But I think you have to have them a lot and often and um, let it just be, there's no closure to it it's not going to be pretty and you just have to let it be. So I think there's a variety of ways that you can do it. It also helps build, people build their muscle memory and their muscle mass around hard, you know, around hard conversations. But if you, if you try to you know, mobilize first without people doing their individual work, you miss that because I think people have to feel that push pull. And there's a paradox that, you know, of, I really want this to change and I don't know how to do it can both be true. I, I want to make changes in the city, but I have some unconscious bias, can both be true, but that's an individualized sport. You can't do it for someone else. It just, yeah. So I, um, I completely agree with Pam in terms of, of how important these conversations are. I think I would challenge us that, um, although I think that it has to start with the individual. I think that the city has to get there too. And that as particularly with the land development code, we had so many conversations and so many arguments that were um, coming from completely different areas. There was the conversation of, I'm scared of this code because I, my neighborhood has been bulldozed in the past by codes because we have been you know, historically disenfranchised because the code has come in and, and done all of these horrible things. Then there's also this other round of fear that got pushed against a lot more that was, I'm scared of this code because I don't want my neighborhood to change because I have benefited from the existing code because I am reaping the benefits of the 1928 code and I don't want it, I don't want the pressures that I see over there, over here. And never, 
did it feel like as a city during those land development conversations, were we actually unpacking the difference between those two? It became just a conversation of whether you want density or whether you don't without actually looking at the pain behind the conversation and the intentions behind the conversation, there was just a lot of finger pointing from one side to the other of, you don't want it because you have implicit bias. You want it because you do have implicit bias without actually unpacking the, the harder conversations that need to be had. And I fought hard on planning commission to try and convince the city staff to stop just showing us pictures of pretty forms and have these conversations about what this impact is actually gonna look like and take some responsibility as a city for the pain and the pressures we have already done so that we can actually move forward and people can feel in, empowered by a new code instead of, um, yeah, bullied by it. Love that. Yeah, that's a great layer. And I, you know, I, you, I don't think you challenged what Pam said. I think you added on to it. I mean, that's a yes and answer all the way. Um, and I, you know, we're, we're at 850 almost. So if we want to take on, and I'm going to put this question to the panelists, we have a few questions in the Q&A. We can go there, um, start winding down a little bit. Donna, I don't mean to cut you off. No. So if you want to throw a, a nugget at us. Please no, it, it'd be too, it, it's somewhat depressing, but I think we have to think <laughs> about the same, think about it, think about, we have other issues within our community that we have to think about the same way. And one of them is the issue of, of, um, of homelessness. And we're going to have that debate this spring. And one of the first things that happens is, it, it, and kind of where we are is, okay, you know, and they go right to a specific issue of the camping ban. And, you know, you start to unpack a lot of these things. You, you, under, you understand the issues of having homeless live on your front porch. You, the fact that they don't have a place to, to wash up or to go to the bathroom. But banning and then pushing them into the woods or someplace you can't see our fellow citizens is not getting to it. It's not having that conversation. And it is an uncomfortable conversation because it is uncomfortable to see, I'm saying it's uncomfortable to see someone who is living in that condition. I'm hoping that's what someone sees when they see that. And they're not totally disparaging of that person. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's that's a conversation that's going to come up. It's going to be on the ballot. It's going to be, you know, we're going to get we're going to spin ourselves around the 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 axle on wording in the in the the ballot um, and still not be able to have the conversations about how do we um, you know, help the weakest within our community. Yeah, uh, completely agree, Donna. I, I, and um, you know, and I think too, there's maybe not direct parallels there, but I think there's there's some consistent theme and conversation about just you know when when we look at um, at East Austin and the development that's happening so quickly. In some ways, it's like that camping ban where if we just bulldoze, you know, and this was a mid 50s, 60s, you know, the trying to uh, what was it called when essentially cities, many cities around the country just Urban Salt. renewal. Urban renewal. Thank you. My, my words went away. Urban renewal was much the same way where they would take entire entire neighborhoods would just disappear overnight in order to build something better. Um, you know, and I think it's not too dissimilar a concept. If you get rid of it and don't see it, then you don't have to deal with it, right? We don't have to deal with that, the pain and all of those um, things that come up. Um, so thank you for chiming in with that. I, there are just a handful of questions and I know we're short on time, so we probably won't be able to get through all of them. I did, I really, I would like to touch on this one very, very brief question, but I think I'm, I'm curious about the answer if you all have any ideas, but um, Erica had asked what cities are getting it right? So does anyone have any examples that they'd like to share? They're all on mute. It's not a good sign. <laughs> I think it's a very difficult question because every city is different and every state has different um, ways in which they help and hinder their cities. I think it's probably easier to look at examples of, of different codes and different policies that are working in different 
areas, but it's not, I don't think there's one city that's really nailing this. And part of that is the lack of conversation that's happening, that is happening and is not happening across the country. Um, I think also that that in a lot of, of where all the different cities are in different places of dealing and recognizing that gentrification is or is a problem. Um, the cities have ebbed and flowed with people in and out of them and they've been hot spots to live. They've been places to run away from throughout the history of, of America, but we're trying to be more conscious about that this time. So I don't, I don't know, I don't have any specific examples, but I, I would think that it would be a, a smaller example than, than the city itself. That's fair. <laughs> hung up on the word right mm. that's what's giving me pause sure we have a bad habit of making things monolithic um and so that word gave me that that held me up but yeah um, i don't know if it's right or wrong i think we i think that's a societal norm too that we perpetuate that's that's a that's a challenge too um and so i think more you know incremental growth moving in the right direction i don't know that that's what gave me that face i was like i don't know what right is yeah, fair. Specifically. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, there and yeah, who's to define right and wrong? Um, I, we we are all this this panel has been uh, exceedingly intelligent in all of its commentary, but I'm certain that we probably don't feel comfortable determining right and wrong right <laughs> right now. And each approach is going to be so unique and different to the to the history and the current story and the pressures. Austin's in a very unique spot you know i look at what we're seeing in terms of growth and i don't know that there's many other communities in the united states that you could point to and say that they have a similar uh, a similar dilemma right now i think we're really we're really at the crux of some some incredible uh numbers of of, de of development that's been happening so i we are down to the last five minutes i was i would like to um kaylin if you are able to pull up there are a few resources that the panel collected that we wanted to share with the group um so if you come away from this conversation hopefully you come away from this conversation with a some fire ignited um whether that's looking inward and doing some personal study i think there's a lot um, a lot to be said for for that work um, or if it's in looking at you know what's happening out there in the world and efforts that are ongoing that you can support um, we have a few different groups that are in town um, that we would encourage you to check out or get involved in. And Trinity, if you don't mind just giving a short overview of each of these, these groups that we're representing on the last two slides, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, I'll make it very quick. I would just say that if you are, since we're talking to design professionals, if you're interested in getting involved in a way that's specific to your skill set, um, the Community Powered Workshop specializes in working with um, existing communities and helping them work through their own planning and um, community planning. So this is like small scale community planning, but if you're into planning and that is your expertise, then this might be a good place to use your services. Um, the Alley Flat Initiative, um, they deal more with putting in um, accessory dwelling units. So as a person who specializes in import, in fill housing and um, looking at ways to get more sustainability into infill housing and into affordable housing, this might be a good place to donate your services and collaborate on those types of projects. Um, the next two are um, Austin Housing Coalition and Austin ha and Housing Works. They look at more big scale multifamily housings. They also deal a lot more with policy um, and with Austin's city policy. So that's a good place to get involved if that's more your cup of tea and your skill set. I also, if you're trying to get, just get your hands dirty, Habitat for Humanity is always a great organization as well. This is not a, a uh, exhaustive list. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we'll we'll close on this thought, um, and obviously, and and many thanks to Mayor Pro Tem Harper Madison for being with us today. So, 
um, you know, step number one, reaching out. And, I, uh, you know, I also appreciate, I'll circle back to Sonia's comment early on, reach out, reach out locally, reach out to um, any elected officials who are having an impact in, in your world. That's what they're there for is to listen, listen and um, represent you. So um, be an advocate, you know, do the work, do the personal work, do, do the group work. Um, hopefully this encouraged you to dive into some of that in, in, in more detail. So um, I'm going to end up, I'm going to pass the mic back over to Inkiru to wrap things up, but I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing panelists. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you, um, to hear your thoughts and experiences, and um, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to have been here to um, work with you tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Thank you very much, Mindy. You were a wonderful moderator. And I will pass this on to Kaylin, who has been the chair of our subcommittee, who worked extremely hard putting this event together. So um, I'll hand it over to Kaylin to say goodnight to all of our attendees. Thank you again to Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Natasha Harper Madison. We really appreciate having you with us. Thanks, Inkiru. Yeah, this event has just been incredible. Um, thank you so much to all of our brilliant panelists who've been so generous with your time and your expertise. I know I've learned so much um, and I know I'm not the only one. Thanks also to Mindy, um, our wonderful moderator for sparking the conversation and weaving these threads of conversation together. Um, and thank you, of course, to our attendees. I hope you enjoyed your Love Bats ice cream. We were really excited to partner with them. Um, it means a lot to us that you spent your evening learning about this important topic that's shaping our city. So thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks for putting this on. <laughs>